Okay, so the topic of today's lecture is about uh, the polynomial method, which is uh, another method for proving lower bound on quantum query complexity. Um, it was invented shortly after the uh, hybrid method that we saw yesterday. And it uses kind of very different ideas that I will try to develop uh, in the lecture, at least the basics. And you will see some nice application in, in the problem session. So this is the high level focus of, of this lecture. The goal will be to prove uh, how we can obtain lower bounds, lower bounds based on the analysis of Boolean function. So we will draw a connection between those two topics. Uh, the analysis of Boolean function is something which has been studied uh, even before quantum computing and for which we do know of a lot of techniques to, to, to analyze those kind of, of objects and it will benefit to the analysis of quantum query complexity. So um, the two main messages of this lecture are the following one. The first one is that we will see that any quantum algorithm computing some function f in this quantum query model can be transformed into a certain polynomial of bounded degree that will approximate the function that we try to compute. And this polynomial, it has some, some nice uh, properties. And then the second, uh, uh, the second important ingredient will be to define ways of lower bounding the degree of polynomials in order to convert this degree result into lower bound on, on the query complexity. So let me start by giving you some basic definition about Boolean analysis. Um, I will, don't go into too much details, just, just the basics. Um, the first one is the definition of a multilinear polynomial. So here the polynomial will take as input uh, n variables, I mean, same kind of input as what we consider in quantum query complexity. And a polynomial is multilinear if it is of the following type. So um, as you can see in each monomial, uh, each xi is taken uh, at least to, so you, either you either have xi or, or one for each position i. Okay, and you have real coefficient. And the degree of such a multilinear polynomial is the size of the largest uh, set S for which the coefficient is non-zero. Okay, so in particular, this, uh, this degree is at most n because you have, at most, because you have n variables. So what we want to understand is how we can approximate arbitrary uh, Boolean function, such as any function f from the hypercube to, to the real numbers, by multilinear polynomials. How well can we approximate those, those kind of objects? So a first answer to, to this uh, question is uh, the following one, which is quite simple to see. I, I won't give a proof, but you can do it as a simple exercise. It says that for any Boolean function, there exists a unique multilinear polynomial, which I denote by pf, that is always equal to the function for, for all input values. Okay, and because of this uniqueness uh, result, we can define in a unique way the degree of any function f as the degree of the corresponding uh, multilinear polynomial. Okay, so we may think that the problem is solved. However, this, condi this condition of being exactly equal is quite, it's, it's quite strict. And the goal will be to kind of relax this condition uh, in order to draw a connection to quantum query complexity. So how can we do that? So this is the fundamental definition of, of, this, of this lecture. We say that a polynomial P approximates the function F if it satisfies the two following condition. So for all value X in the hypercube, you want first Px and Fx to be close to each other up to a value one third. And secondly, you want px to be between 0 and 1. Okay, so this one third, it should remind you the success condition that we uh, used when defining the quantum query model. And this is indeed, uh, there is indeed a connection between, between the, the two choices, um, as, you, as, as you will see in, in a moment. So what's important to notice is that this approximation polynomial is no longer unique uh, unless uh, this polynomial pf. And so we will define the approximate degree uh, with this tilde, tilde notation as 
the minimum degree of a polynomial that approximates f. Uh, so we, we, we minimize over all the polynomials that, that approximate f, and this is how we define the approximate degree. Okay, so this approximate degree is always uh, smaller than the exact degree because you are allowed to some approximation in the, in the, in the definition. Okay, so this is a first example. Let, let's pick the on function. So it takes as input n bits and it output one if and only if the and of, the all, of all the bits is equal to one. For the exact degree, it's quite simple to see that the corresponding polynomial is just the product of all, your of all the variables. So the degree of the on function is equal to n. And on the other hand, you can show that the approximate degree of the on function is only equal to square root n. So you can, you can obtain a quadratic decrease by looking at this approximate uh, degree definition. And this result is, is not that simple to, to show, just to give you one idea. Um, in order to construct this, uh, such an approximation polynomial of small degree, you have to play with a Chebyshev polynomial, and you have to plug inside some, uh, some summation of all your input variables. Okay, so you can try, if, if you know, uh, what the Chebyshev polynomial are, we can try to, to obtain such uh, a result. Um, so, in, in some sense, um, if, if, if you know some quantum algorithms, you may, you may already know that there exists actually a quantum algorithm for computing this on function that uses square root n quantum queries. Okay, so on this particular example, there is kind of the same complexity if you look at quantum query complexity and if you look at approximate degree. And the goal will be to try to develop this connection for other problems and to try to see if it, this is a more general phenomenon. Okay, so before going in, into, uh, into the, the results, I would just like to mention two textbooks which are uh, really good in my opinion if you want to know more about uh, Boolean analysis, analysis in, in general and the connection to, to quantum computing. Um, there is of course a book of Ryan on uh, many different topics related to Boolean functions. And also a book by Mark Bunn and Justin Taylor, which is more connected to this relation between quantum computing, approximate degree, and Boolean function. Okay, so let's, let's move to the fundamental theorem, this connection between approximate degree and quantum query complexity. So this is the following result. It says that for any function f uh, that you try to solve on, in this quantum query model, the complexity will always be at least the approximate degree uh, divided by two. Okay, so as long as you know how to lower bound this approximate degree, then you immediately obtain a lower bound on the quantum query complexity. So I will, I will prove this, this uh, theorem in a minute. Um, the main uh, result that, you, that, you, yes, that, that we will need to, to, to prove this uh, theorem is the following one. It says that if you fix any quantum algorithm that makes t queries, and if you let px uh, denotes the probability that, uh, that it outputs one on input x, so this is gonna be a real number between zero and one, then the degree of p is at most two t. Okay, so let's, let's prove this result. And for that, let me just remind you some notation that we used uh, yesterday. So this is our, how we define uh, this, this quantum query model. So just a reminder, we have this quantum circuit that alternates between applying a unitary and Oracle gates, gate. And we let psi xt denote the intermediate states of, of uh, the algorithm after you made t queries. So in order to prove the proposition, we will do that by uh, induction on the number of, uh, on the number of, of queries. So let's, let's do it. I will try to incline the board. Yesterday, not everyone was able to see. So, what we will show by we'll prove the following result by induction on t. So by induction on t,
So we want to prove that for all index i between 1 and n, this is what is contained into the first register, indices. And for all Boolean values b, this is what is contained in the second register of, of the memory. Um, what we have is that if you look at the inner product between i, b, and the state psi x, t, after t queries, this is a polynomial in x of degree at most t. Can, can everyone see the board? Yeah. Okay, I'll try to do it bigger. Okay, so just to say it again, um, if you look at the amplitude into this state uh, psi xt for all i, i, b, this is going to be a polynomial in x uh, of degree at most t. A multilinear polynomial in x of degree at most t. Okay, so base case, so for at the beginning, so for t, okay, I should do it bigger, you see. Okay. That way? Okay, so for t equals zero, this is the simplest case. So initially, uh, if you remember, we just have the first state, psi x zero, is just u zero applied on zero zero. So this is independent from, from x. So in particular, this is a polynomial, uh, this is a constant polynomial. Okay? So it implies that I B is a constant. Okay, so now how do we move from t to t, to t plus 1? So let's define. Um, so let's, let's define the following thing. So we define coefficient. A, G, C. Okay, so we have complex coefficients. And such that we want the following equation. So if you take a summation over all the A, G, C dagger, G, C, what you get is the next unitary apply on IB. Okay, so this is just notation. I'm using the dagger because it will be more convenient for, for the proof. Um, so when I apply the next unitary ut plus 1 on a state ib of, of the memory, I just express this, this state into the standard basis. So over all g and c, j is going to be an integer between 1 and n, and c is going to be a Boolean value. Okay, so this is how we define those coefficients. Okay, so now let, let's prove the result. So what we want to prove is that if you look at the inner product between IB and Psi X T plus 1, this is a polynomial of degree at most T plus 1. So how can you write this expression? So first, you can relate Psi X T plus 1 to Psi X T, 
by using the equation that we already used yesterday. So this is going to be equal to IB. And then you apply um, UT plus 1 or X, the oracle, and then psi XT. Okay, I just replace psi XT plus 1 with its definition. Okay, so now what I can do is this quantity on the left, I can express it using the coefficient AJ, uh, AJC that I define. Okay, so this is equal to a summation over all JC, AJC, Okay, so again, what I did was just to replace this IB UT plus 1 by its expression into the, the standard basis. So this is now where it's going to be interesting. So um, we want to understand what happens when we apply this OX on a state on any basic basis state. Um, so the claim that is the following one. If you apply the oracle on JC, for any JC, um, so by definition, this is equal to JC plus XI. This is a definition of, of the oracle gate. And a different way of writing down this expression is as follows. This is equal to, so xj, 1 minus xj, jc, plus xj, jc plus 1. So this is really the most important part of, of the proof. When you do a quantum query, you can express that as a combination of basis state that do not depend on xj. The dependence is displayed inside the amplitude. Okay? So you can just check that this is indeed the, the case. Okay, and then now if I continue the proof, well, this is, this is mostly done because now, what, what it means is that this inner product is going to be summation over all these quantities. Okay, and this, is, this concludes the proof because by induction, those inner products are of degree at most t. We multiply by a coefficient of degree 1, so we obtain something of degree t plus 1. Any question on this proof? Yes? Okay, so this was for proving this uh, statement. Okay, I, I haven't proved the proposition yet. Okay. okay, so I just proved this proposi this result, which was on the amplitude. Okay, so now for the proposition, why why do we have this two t? Well, it's because uh, so what, what does it imply? Um, so wh what is p x? Probability. So p x is the probability that the algorithm outputs one. So what it is, we already saw, it, saw that yesterday, this is equal to projecting on the second register containing 
um, a 1 for the final state psi xt squared. Okay, so this, this was really the definition that we saw yesterday. Um, okay, so a different way of writing that is to say that this is equal to a summation over all, um, over all i of i 1 psi xt squared. Okay, so this, uh, this output probability is a summation over those squared inner product. Okay, and because of this proof by induction, we know that each inner product is of degree at most t, so overall px is of, is of degree at most 2t. Okay, so this is for the proof of, of the proposition. So now, how do we get the, the theorem? So for the theorem, there is essentially nothing to, to prove. We did all, all we already prove all, all we need. So for the theorem, if you have a quantum algorithm computing the function f, so if you have an algorithm, uh, let's say a computing f, by doing capital T queries, Um, what does it imply? It implies that there exists a polynomial P, P such that the degree of P is at most 2t. And the second thing is Px minus f of x. Um, okay, so let's write it differently. So Px, the probability that, that, that it outputs 1, it's going to be between 0 and 1 third if f of x is equal to 0. And if f of x is equal to 1, it's going to be between 2 thirds and 1. Okay, this is by definition of the algorithm being correct. Okay, so this is exactly those three conditions. This is exactly what we need to uh, apply this uh, approximate degree definition. So it implies that the approximate degree of f is less than 2t. Okay, and then if you put it in the other direction, it means that t is at least degree of f, approximate degree of f over 2, which is how you get the, the main theorem. Okay, any question on this? Yes? Say again? Can I, can I what? Oh, take photos. Yeah, you can find the proof sketches on uh, my web page, if you want. Okay, so now let's try to apply this theorem to obtain some concrete lower bounds. Yes? Yes, yes, go ahead. Thank you. 
yeah, so if you want to handle measurement and like extra workspace, you can just replace measurement by controlled not operation. And you can have like your unitary being applied on a larger space. And essentially the proof will follow uh, in a similar way. It will just change, like you will have to consider a larger space for, for you for up when you apply the U uh, unitaries, but it's not a big deal. Okay, so, um, um, so now the, the goal is to find like efficient way to lower bound this approximate degree. So this is usually something complicated to do because uh, you want to study some polynomial that depends on n variables. And so a natural idea is to first try to reduce the number of variables uh, that occur in, in this polynomial. So for that, we will see a, a technique uh, uh, which is called symmetrization. It's more like a family of, of techniques. Um, so, um, um, as I said, when, if you want to analyze multivariate polynomials, it's often hard to, to do. And symmetrization gives you a way of reducing um, the number of variables in your polynomial um, without increasing the approximate degree and by preserving some, some good properties that you can then use in, in the analysis. So I would like to show you maybe the most basic type of symmetrization, uh, which is sometimes called the Minsky paper uh, symmetrization. And um, you should think that ideally what you would like to obtain at the end is a polynomial with just one or two variables. I mean, those are the polynomials for which we know how to obtain uh, efficient bound on the approximate degree. So you would like to reduce to polynomials with very few variables. Um, so let's, let's, let's see how this symmetrization technique works on, on a particular example. So again, this is going to be the OR function that we saw yesterday. And um, at the end, what we'll obtain is a polynomial with just a single variable, so a univariate polynomial. It's, it's not going to be a Boolean function, but it's going to be a univariate polynomial. So the construction um, proceeds as follows. So first is uh, you partition your hypercube into n plus 1 buckets, uh, denoted by bk. And those buckets contain all the n-bit strings that have the same Hamming weight. Okay, so B0 is going to be just the all zero string, and then when you increase k, you increase the Hamming weight. Now, this is how you define the symmetrized polynomial. Um, you define this polynomial denoted by P uh, sim k as being the expectation value over the input contained in the bucket k of P of x. Okay, so this is uh, the definition. So it may not seem obvious why it is a polynomial uh, in, in k of small degree. So um, we will prove two results. The first one is that this is indeed a polynomial in k, and the degree can only decrease. So this is the first lemma that we will show. And the second lemma is that it kind of have similar properties, approximation properties, to the original polynomial in the following sense. When you plug in the value 0, k equals 0, it must give you something which is between 0 and 1 third. And if you plug in something which is larger than 0, it should give you something which is between 2 thirds and 1. OK, so this is uh, how it should look like. Um, it should jump from something very close to 0, then to something very close to 1, and then it should stay close to 1 up to the last value n. OK, so let's, let's prove those two results. Um, it's, it's quite simple. So for the first lemma, we just have to try to uh, give an exact expression of what is this polynomial. So um, let's, let's compute it. So um, let's first focus on a particular monomial. So 
let's pick S to be a subset of indices between uh, 1 and n. Okay, and you define xs as the product of the variables whose indices is in S. Okay, so what we would like to compute is the expectation over the bucket uh, BK. So when we take X uniformly at random in bucket BK, we want to understand what is the expectation values of this XS. Okay, so there is a first very simple case which is that this must be equal to zero if k uh, is less than s. Okay, and otherwise, you just have to apply some, uh, the right binomial coefficient. So, Essentially, if you want it to be non-zero, it means that you have to sample something that is equal to one exactly on the position indexed by i. Okay, so this is equal to n minus size of s, choose uh, n minus k, divided by n choose k. Okay, so n choose k, those are the number of uh, inputs in the bucket bk. And here, this is the number of inputs for which you will obtain value one. Okay, and this quantity, you can um, simplify it. So it is, this is gonna be something that depends on the product of k, k minus one, et cetera, up to k minus uh, s, s plus one. And then divide it by something that do not that does not depend on k. Okay, and as you can see, this is a polynomial in k of degree s. So this is for a single monomial. Now if you want to handle the case of a combination of monomials, so just, uh, this, this is gonna also gonna be a polynomial of degree at most, um, of degree at most the largest degree in the original polynomial. Okay, so this is for the first lemma. Now for the second lemma, this is, uh, this is straightforward. So for the second lemma, what we want to show is that this symmetrized polynomial is between zero and one third at value zero, and then it jumps to something larger than two thirds. So why do we have that? Well, it's just because um, when you evaluate this polynomial at value zero, it's equal, it's equal to an expectation over all x in B0 of uh, Px. And we know that, um, we know that by definition, this is between uh, zero and one third. Okay, so if you take an expectation of something between zero and one third, you get something which is between zero and one third. Okay, so why is it be between zero and one third? It's because when the input has Hamming weight zero, then the, out the output has to be zero. This is uh, the value of the OR function. And the algorithm has to output the correct value with probability two third. So this Px probability of outputting one should be less than one third. Okay, so this is because um, the OR function evaluated on X 
is equal to zero for all x in B0. There is actually a single one in B0. OK, and now for k larger than, larger than 1, this is the same argument. This polynomial is an expectation values over um, inputs that all give you something which is between 2 thirds and 1. Okay, because if the Hamming weight is at least one, then the output of the OR function has to be at least one. Okay, so how, how to conclude the proof? Well, the conclusion, you, you, you will have to prove it in the, in the problem session. But essentially, this is how the proof can be concluded. Um, one can show by using some nice inequalities that if you have a polynomial that kind of jumps this way very quickly from 0 to, to 1, then it must be of degree at least square root n. Okay, you cannot find such a polynomial of, of, of degree smaller than, than square root n. And in particular, because of this fundamental theorem that connects the approximate degree and query complexity, it implies that for the OR function, you have a square root n lower bound. Okay, so this, this is the conclusion at the end. Um, the query complexity of the OR function is at least square root n. So it gives you a second proof of what we saw last time using the hybrid uh, method, but now by using polynomial and Boolean analysis. Okay, any question? Yes? Well, it's going to be useful when the symmetrization uh, works fine, like it's kind of natural, so it's not going to be... I mean, okay, finding the right symmetrization is uh, usually the one of the most complicated parts. So this is one of the simplest symmetrization that you can imagine. It works well when the function is uh, symmetric, meaning you can permute the input without changing the output. Uh, but for more complicated function, uh, or for like non-Boolean function, non-Boolean input in larger alphabets, you may have to use more complicated symmetrization techniques. Okay, so this symmetrization technique, it was really important to, uh, I mean, w one of the main goals was to reduce the number of variables involved in the polynomial. Um, but sometimes when you reduce the number of variables, you lose too much, and at the end, uh, you cannot gets like an optimal lower bound. So there is a second type of method, which I think is, has been studied kind of like more recently. And in some sense, it does not rely on reducing the number of variables. Instead, it relies on using uh, LP duality. So this is called the dual polynomials uh, method. Um, I will just try to give you a high level description of how it works um, without going into the details of, of the proof. So for understanding this method, it will be more convenient to kind of change a little bit um, the, 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 the definition. So for Boolean function now, we will move to the minus one one domain instead of the zero one domain. Um, this is something that you can do without loss of generality by just, um, uh, by just replacing um, a value, uh, let's say, uh, xi with... Uh, um, with 1 minus 2xi. Okay, so this minus 1, 1 domain uh, is just for simplifying the, the statement of, of the result. So the first observation is that the approximate degree can be formulated as an optimization program, a linear program, in the following way. So what you want to do is you want to minimize some epsilon, it's going to be a real number between um, 0 and 1. And um, the minimization is over epsilon and over polynomial p. And what you want to do is you want to find px, which is epsilon close to the function for which you want to understand the approximate degree. So this is the first condition. px minus fx is at most epsilon in absolute distance for all input x. 
secondly, you want the degree of p to be at most d, and epsilon has to be at least zero. Okay, so in some sense, a different way of formulating this program is to say that we are looking for the best approximation of f by a polynomial of degree at most d. Okay, so if we go back to the OR function, for instance, what we would like to do is we would like to replace f with the OR function, and then we will take d to be uh, square root n, or constant times square root n, and then we want to understand if there is a feasible solution uh, of value uh, at most uh, one-third. Okay, so if you can solve this program, then you can know what is approximate degree. So when you have a linear program, uh, what's, what, what's, what you often want to, to do is you want to take its dual. So here, here is what is the, the dual. Uh, I'm not going to show how you can obtain it, but uh, at least you will see that this is indeed a linear program. You will see that in the problem session. So the dual um, is formulated as follows. So now you take a maximization over function uh, phi uh, defined over the, the Boolean cube, and you look at this inner product between phi and x under two conditions. The first one is a kind of a normalization condition which says, which say that if you sum up all the absolute value of f of x, then it must be equal to one. And the second condition is if you look at the inner product between this function and any polynomial of degree at most d, then it must be equal to zero. Okay, so intuitively what it means, this kind of inner product summation, you can look at them as being kind of correlation statement. And in some sense, this maximization should give you the best possible correlation of f with a polynomial phi, uh, which has no monomial of degree, d, of, of degree less than d. Okay, so let's, let's maybe prove this um, last statement, which is that any phi that satisfies this uh, program has no monomial of degree at most d. So this will give some intuition about uh, this type of, of, of linear program. So my claim is that any feasible solution, phi, um, has no monomial of degree of degree uh, less than d. Okay, so this is just a one-line proof. Um, so for the proof, we just consider two subsets, S and T, subset of indices. So those are integer between one and M. Okay, and we look at the corresponding inner product. So a summation over all X of XS times xt. Okay, and x is in minus 1, 1 to the n. Okay, so we only need to consider such cases because then when you have a summation of phi x px, you can just, by linearity, you can extend the, the result. So wha what is this quantity equal to? Um, so, you can see that if an, index, if, if an index is in the intersection of S and T, then uh, the product of, uh, of Xi and Xi showing up in, in the two quantities will give you one. So it would kind of, of disappear. Um, so you only care about the elements which are not in the intersection of S and T.
Okay, so what you get is a summation of x over the indices which are in t but not in s, and then indices that are in s but not in t. Okay, and now what happens, so there are two cases, so either those two sets are empty, in which case you would obtain uh, the value 2 to the n, so this is equal to 2 to the n if um, if s uh, is equal to t, and if s is not equal to t, then this is equal to 0. Okay, so the only way that you can obtain something non-zero is by taking two sets which are equal to, to each other. Okay, so this last condition, this summation of phi x, px being zero for all polynomial of degree at most d, is equivalent to having no monomial of degree less than d. Okay, so how can we use this kind of dual, uh, this kind of dual program? And I will conclude with uh, this um, slide. So um, now we can apply weak duality, and it gives us the following statement, the kind of following recipe for proving lower bound on, on the approximate degree. And observe that we never reduce the number of variables. We really keep all the variables. Um, so it says that by weak duality, uh, if we can find any function phi, so just find one of them, that satisfied the following three conditions. So first, you want a high correlation with uh, f of x, uh, meaning you want this summation to be at least one third. Secondly, you want to satisfy this um, normalization constraint that tells you that the summation of the absolute value is equal to one. And finally, you have to satisfy what is called this pure high degree constraint, uh, which say that you have no monomial of degree less than d, then under those three conditions, the approximate degree of f has to be at least, at least d. Okay, so if you just construct such a phi, you immediately obtain a proof that the approximate degree is larger than, than something. Um, so, um, during the problem session, you, you, you will prove that uh, those are indeed, uh, so those two programs are indeed linear programs. And you will see one simple application of, of this result uh, by proving a lower bound for, for the parity function. So you, you will be asked to find a polynomial that witness uh, that the parity function has a high approximate degree. Okay, and there will be other questions based also on, uh, uh, on the symmetrization technique, but for other kind of, of application uh, where we, it's not necessarily based on the Minsky paper symmetrization. Uh, and uh, you will see some application, for instance, um, to the, let me see, remember, to the uh, majority function, I think. So, is there any question on these dual polynomials? Okay, so it went shorter than I expected. Um, I can maybe start talking about the, the next method that we will see tomorrow. Yes? Or for constructing those dual polynomials. Um, so they have some nice properties. So for instance, they have some nice composition property uh, in certain, certain cases. Uh, but usually they are quite complicated to, to construct. Like even constructing a dual polynomial for the OR function, for instance, this is quite a complicated task. So yeah, I would say the composition property are maybe more interesting here. Well, you can get some, some, some results about the, the approximate degree of composition. Uh, so if you know the individual, individual approximate, if you have feasible solution for 
for different functions. By composing them, you can say something about the composition of the of the of the of the feasible solution. Well, um, yeah, I mean block composition of functions. Yeah, you want to say something about block composing function. Like you want f of so each bit of x1 up to xn is obtained by com by computing some other function. So you want to compose a two function. Let's say the and function apply on bits which are obtained by applying the or function. You see, like you could have like trees of and on or and so on. Okay, so let me maybe just give you a flavor of what we will talk about uh, next time. So I, I will just tell you about the motivation, and if you went to the previous talk by, uh, by Alex, uh, you will see that there is some uh, some room for, for connection, I would say. So tomorrow we will say um, a very recent technique. So the, the hybrid method that we saw yesterday and the polynomial method are quite, quite old. And um, there have been many improvements over those, those methods. And there is a kind of different method which has been uh, developed recently uh, with some cryptographic motivation by Mark Zandri. This is called the recording method or the compressed oracle method. And this is kind of related to the hy hybrid method, but in a more, uh, more uh, let's say, intuitive way. So this is just what I want to say for, for the next lecture, what will be, uh, what will be the, the focus. We will try to look at kind of um, a framework which often shows up in cryptography, and in particular, when you try to analyze, uh, when you try to give security proof in the random oracle model. So the random oracle model in cryptography, this is a kind of an ideal setting in which you replace um, concrete hash functions, such as shade 3 you replace them with completely uniform random function. So how do you represent a uniform random function? Well, you could say, I have an input x, uh, which now is not over a binary alphabet, but instead is over a larger alphabet, let's say of size n. Um, and in some sense, the highest uh, coordinate of the input is the same as evaluating a random function on input i. Okay, so you don't care about how the hash function is implemented, you just care about like how many times do I have to evaluate this ideal hash function. So this is really what is called the random oracle model. And quantumly, uh, there is the so-called quantum random oracle model that allows you to query this input uh, in superposition. So um, this setup usually is considered uh, not under some worst case um, analysis. So you don't really, you, you kind of, you are okay if the algorithm can sometimes fail. Uh, on some input. So, so you could have some input x for which the algorithm uh, will always uh, fail in solving the problem that you are interested in. What's important is that on average, when you draw the input uniformly at random, then on, av on average you want the algorithm to be correct with high probability. So this is closer to what you can observe in, in a concrete uh, cryptographic scenario. Um, so this is very close to quantum query complexity, uh, I mean, to the technique that we saw until, until now. But in order to handle this average case analysis on this large alphabet, um, it may not be the simplest thing to just try to use a polynomial method or the hybrid method or some adversary method that we will see later on. And the goal of this recording technique will be to give a very uh, intuitive and very simple way of proving lower bound uh, in, this, uh, in this setting. And in particular, we will show that you can prove lower bound for finding uh, pre-images, so for pre-image attack, and also for finding collision uh, in, in hash function. So for both problems, it will, it, will, it will be possible to achieve the optimal quantum query complexity 
in a very simple way by using this uh, recording method that we will see um, tomorrow.